I'm under the impression that our next uh, contributor, speaker, probably doesn't need a tremendous amount of introduction, seeing as he's a professor here. Uh, not everybody knows him. Not everybody no. knows him. This no, is Richard, no. Professor Richard Williams. Oh, yeah. uh, this is professor, professor Richard Williams, who is a professor here at ETA. Uh, who will be talking to us today about psychoanalysis in the city, uh, which is a topic that has worked on quite a bit in the past. Uh, he's done quite a lot of work in relation to psychoanalysis and architecture, including his most recent book, which is Sex and Buildings. Is that the correct That's right, that's the one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's also a blogger writing uh, about architecture and psychoanalysis. Um, and his favourite colour is blue. That's what I got from the biography. Yeah, that's what, yeah, hence the. <laughs> so take it away, Richard. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Indeed. Right. Um, okay, what, what I thought I would, I would do uh, is, is quite informal, uh, in a way. I mean, I've got, I've got various things to say, but essentially it's a, it's a narrative, um, and I'll, I'll describe the different ways that I've used psychoanalysis, or psychoanalysis has used me in, in various kinds of work um, and I, I'm not going to try and say anything very complicated uh, and there's a few images uh, and I, I wanted to say something about uh, you know how I came to it and and uh, in a sense give, give a um, give, give you an indication of how how, how useful or, or not this this has been so uh, just you know stop me at any time or if you want to you know if you want to uh, talk about an image or, or um, ask any questions, just, just do. I, I'm, not, I'm not imagining this as a, a polished and finished thing at all. It's basically, I'm, I'm going to describe you know, what, what I do. Um, so uh, there, there are a few images, and this, um, in fact, is a, well, it's, it's a, uh, well, photography is something I do quite a lot, uh, increasingly, and it's, uh, although it's, it started as an instrumental practice, you know, I'd illustrate things that I was looking at. Uh, increasingly, it, it, it stands um, alone. But this is a, a fragment of the um, it's the Judenplatz in, in Vienna, and uh, it, I did go and have a look at Vienna um, uh, in uh, thinking about psychoanalysis, and, and, and that's one of the things I've done. Um, but I'm going to start with a uh, uh, with a slightly um, confessional um, few um, remarks. Uh, the, there, are, there are several starting points for all this. I mean, what, one is, a, I suppose, an intellectual starting point. And uh, if, if I was to, to name a particular um, passage in Freud that, that is important for this, I'd say it was this, which you probably know. You could probably identify. Yeah? Where is it, where is it from? It's got the Oh, well, it's got the wind. Okay, so we, you know, it's the the uncanny, nineteen nineteen. I mean, the, the the uncanny is this, you know, huge, sprawling, complicated essay that that uh, we we always give undergraduate students to to read and and uh, slightly regret afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but it, it does have this uh, amazing passage, which uh, you know describes uh, uh, um, in, in an anecdotal way. Um, what, what to me looks like a like a panic attack actually. I mean, it's a it's an episode of uh, sudden uh, fear, difficult to quantify, uh, and it and it gets worse through repetition, so or, or familiarity. Um, now, uh, for, for all sorts of reasons, this this jumped out at me when I first read it, and I I, I liked three things about it. I liked the fact that uh, it was um, a first person narrative, and if you know you you. Most of you, you know, you know Freud, and you, you know that he, he often does this and, and uh, in, interjects um, quite dense theoretical writing with with personal anecdotes, as if to illustrate the point that he's making. And I, I um, you know, frankly, I, you know, I find that attractive and uh, helpful. So there's that. It describes uh, fear, um, which is a, a, an emotion. Uh, that is, is often hard to describe exactly, but he's describing, a, a, I suppose, quite a you know, specialised um, variant of that. So that, that was also appealing. And it was the fact that um, the whole thing was framed by architecture. So it's these three things. It's the first-person narrative, it's the fear, and it's the architecture, all of those things. And, and to be honest, I think just about everything I've done since <laughs> reading this has you know, somehow been conditioned by that and th those things. Um, so it's a, it's a very important passage. So, um, so that, that, that's one starting point. Uh, as I say, I wanted to say something slightly confessional, which is, um, in, in a way, un underpinned 
my um, earlier question to the panel, which was, you know, very simply, what, what does it matter to, to know about the, the professional practice of psychoanalysis and uh, allied um, practices? And I, I ask that partly because I, I know about it. I mean, I, I, um, I've been at, at various points, you know, over quite a long period, a, a client uh, of, of various um, kinds of psychotherapy, mostly informed by psychoanalysis. I, I have actually experienced um, some pretty straight Freudian psychoanalysis as well, and, and was rather frightened by it, but you know, <laughs> did it anyway. Um, and so, so I have quite quite long experience like that. But I also, in in the university, um, I often talk to um, clinical psychologists. I talk to people in the the, the area of counselling and psychotherapy, uh, and I, I to, to an extent, I keep up with the the literature. I mean, I, I I don't do it in a systematic way, but I do I do read things. And I've been quite uh, influenced by uh, sometimes quite popular things. And as you um, mentioned, the, the, the book Sex and Buildings, I mean, what, one of the things that really conditioned that was actually a piece of popular psychology, I mean, or popular analysis, whatever you want to call it, uh, called Mating in Captivity by a, uh, an, an Israeli Belgian American uh, analyst called uh, Esther Perel. And I, I was. Um, you know, it, it, it was a, a, an attention-grabbing, popular airport bookstore sort of book, but, but at the same time, it, it synthesised a lot of quite complex ideas, and it was a big influence. Um, so it's important to um, say those things, I think. In terms of uh, why I had some uh, engagement with uh, architecture or, or with, you know, with, the, with this area as, as a client, um, some of it has been academic, you know, some of it has just been out of interest, that I, it's a thing that I like to do. But some of it was also driven by uh, experiences that I, I felt that I, you know, I needed to um, explain or, or, or understand more about. And in my case, the uh, experiences were in fact very like this. So Freud describes a... You know, a, a a feeling of, of fear that comes upon him for no particular reason. And I certainly experienced lots of things like that, which in, in, in fact, um, over a period of time, uh, could become really quite morbid and, and quite debilitating. So uh, I, I wanted to know more about those things. The curious thing was that those experiences were almost exactly coterminous with my arrival here in this city. <laughs> so you know, it may be, I think it's quite common to uh, experience some kind of psychological distress or, or, or change when you're uh, in a, a situation of circumstantial change and you know you don't know how or when or, or, or why that's going to manifest itself but I think um, in my case it, it did and it manifested itself uh, in a uh, fairly uh, morbid and long term condition of anxiety, which is extremely common, but no less debilitating for that. Uh, now, it was framed and very often triggered by architecture. <laughs> uh, and well, one of the, the things that I became uh, extremely conscious of was uh, the, the way that the architecture of the city uh, started to take on qualities that were um, unexpected. So this is a, a city which is you know, famed for being beautiful and agreeable and well-planned and rich, but whatever. Uh, my experience of it was in often a bit of a city that was rather fearful, so uh, a place where the, the architecture itself could take on uh, rather alarming qualities, and in particular the, the 19th century architecture. What, what you're looking at here, in fact, is my street uh, in, in uh, south of Edinburgh, about two miles from here, uh, with a whole set of uh, bay windows, uh, drawing rooms there, uh, and I, I came to associate these uh, buildings with uh, unpleasant or, or difficult situations. So th there's no nothing necessarily rational about this, but I, but I started to make an association between the architecture and uh, a, a, a psychological condition, as it were. So I think it's important that you, you know that. Uh, so uh, I... Um, that, that's part of my background. The Edinburgh, it turned out, 
was a very interesting place to start thinking about these things because it's a, a city unlike any other large city in the UK. It didn't suffer any big trauma during the Second World War. It was never bombed. It's never uh, suffered um, or experienced large-scale population migrations or change or anything like that. It's a place that is very, very stable in lots of ways. Uh, and it has a very large and very um, visible, very confident middle-class population that lives more or less in the centre of the city and has lived there for a long time. And, you know, it, 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 it's a very important part of the city's identity. And it, it, when you start to think about these things, you start to uh, think, well, actually, in a way, it's not altogether unlike the early 20th century Vienna that, that Freud was describing. I mean, it's not, it's not the same place, but it, it's not. If you were to pick a place in the UK that, that was a bit like it, yes, you would certainly pick this. There was a, there's a fairly close approximation. And the kinds of anxieties and concerns that uh, Freud's uh, clients had are not altogether unlike the anxieties that clients might have, the psychotherapists here. And if, if you know the area, if you know the city, you know that there are an awful lot of psychoanalysts here, or an awful lot of psychotherapists <laughs> here. Uh, there are a lot of neurotic people. Uh, there are people who have a lot of time on their hands and can afford to do it. Um, there are people who... Uh, it, it is it, a perfect client base for uh, a, a large population of, of people like this. On top of that, you've got the, the university, you have uh, the, the hospitals, uh, a whole ancillary medical um, psychological profession. You have a, a big hospital that deals with um, psychiatry. I mean, it's, it, it, it couldn't be more perfect in a way for, for these things. Um, and uh, when you uh, talk to um, people in these professions, you, you understand very quickly that this is a city that, you know, outwardly uh, is almost perfect, you know, a wonderful place, whatever, but it inwardly has all kinds of neuroses. It's an extremely neurotic place. It's a place uh, that was described to, to me recently by, by a uh, clinical psychologist. Uh, you know, in, in her experience, this was a place that had an enormous amount of suppressed rage. It was a very angry place, and I, I have experienced this. I've been on the receiving end of an extraordinary amount of rage here that sort of has efflorescences every so often and it's not uh, it may just be me I don't know maybe I create it <laughs> yeah, I'll get my coat but I think it's important to to, to, to explore these things that the, these are we're not just talking about a, 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 you know academic speculation let's say or something that just exists in literature or art we're actually talking about a, a, you know, a real city with, with real neuroses and real problems and uh, all of that Anyway, so there, there's, some, there's some background. So what, what did I uh, do with it? Um, well, this, I think, is probably the first large-scale attempt to do something with it. And it's, uh, it's a book in uh, 2004, so it's 10 years old now, um, called The Anxious City. And it was, uh, I uh, came to the title um, quite late on. It's actually not, it's not about Edinburgh, and it's not about cities in general. Uh, it's actually, it was actually about a very specific... Um, situation. I was looking at uh, British architectural debates and discourse over a 30, 40 year period. Um, but looking at uh, those debates, I was essentially looking at the period immediately after the Second World War, looking at those debates, increasingly it seemed that the, the word anxiety was a, a useful one. And I, I used it in two ways. And the, the first way was as a, as a metaphor that I, I, what I understood through the reading was that uh, there, were, there was um, a very marked tension um, between uh, a, I suppose, re realistic tendency towards urbanisation. I mean, that Britain is a very urban country, it's quite dense, it, it, it has to have cities, it's... Uh, um, yeah, it, it, it is an urban nation. There's a tension between that and uh, some very powerful, deep-seated, anti-urban tendencies and an inability over quite a long period to really resolve that. So what, what you ended up with was in, in um, you know, certain cases, perhaps most cases for a while, you, you ended up with development that 
was trying not to be development somehow. And I, I, we, I won't go into the, the, the individual cases now, we don't, don't have time for that, but there was a, a very marked tension and you, you, often, you saw that in all sorts of places. It was as if uh, the, the place was urban but people didn't want to recognise it as, as urban. And, and it seemed to be much more than about incompetence or bad planning or you know, poor decisions or whatever, but something deep-seatedly cultural and, and sort of cultural, psychological, as it were. So I, I use the word anxiety to describe that, uh, that tension. The, the other thing I used, uh, or I th thought about in, in, in that book, was uh, a sort of literal anxiety. And it was in relation to, to this kind of thing. What, what you're looking at is obviously Trafalgar Square, but specifically th this is a photograph that was produced by um, Foster and Partners, the, the, the architecture practice, who were charged with refurbishing the square in, in the early 2000s. I think it's 2002 this, this is um, done. It involves a large-scale pedestrianisation project. Um, I got very interested in, in these uh, public space projects, and it, it's a big theme in the book. So there's a chapter called The Politics of Public Space, and you can you know, imagine what goes into that. But I was very interested in, in the, uh, the public rhetoric around these things, where there seemed to be complete certainty that public space was a good thing, and squares were a good thing, and that if you did, uh, if you refurbished or, or built new public spaces, people would be happy that their, their, their psychological lives, you know, their, in their inner lives would be better. There was a, there was a total certainty in, in the public discourse around that. Uh, and yet what, what I wanted to uh, somehow express was that that wasn't necessarily the case, that, that there was no um, direct or provable relationship between a certain kind of urban design uh, and the experience of that, that urban design. But very often, in fact, you might experience, uh, in, in public space, you might experience a lot of psychological distress. And I could think partly of my own experience, but I, I could think of very well-documented experiences going back 100 or so years uh, which, which uh, looks uh, at how um, difficult and disturbing being in public in the city could be. And very often in those spaces which are habitually associated with pleasure, let's say. So this, uh, the, and the, the term um, agoraphobia is probably the, you know, the, the, the key one here. So this is a uh, you know, rather sort of strange, very well-known painting by, by Gustave uh, Caillebotte from 1877 which describes something of that, and it, you know, it's been much uh, explored uh, in terms of uh, representing the city as, as a strange, alienating place. So I wanted to, to uh, explore something of that in relation to um, contemporary um, building projects. So I, I did look at agoraphobia, and I did think about anxiety as a spe specific phenomenon in relation to specific um, public spaces. I didn't really come to any conclusions apart from saying that you know you, you cannot uh, assume that you build in a particular way and you get a particular uh, inner response to, to that. The, the, the relationship between one's psychological life and the built form is arbitrary. It's, you know, it depends on many more factors. So that, that's an important idea and I've you know, worked with that for now, now for a long time. So uh, just a, a few other things um, to uh, to um, try and explain what I've been doing. Um, I suppose I, I you know, with, with my, my own experience and then the kind of reading that I was doing, I, I did I developed a slight horror of historical cities and, and uh, found myself increasingly drawn to places that, that were not like that. So th this is um, Los Angeles, um, you know, Wilshire Boulevard mm. from uh, the Griffith Park Observatory. And uh, Los Angeles was one place that I found I was spending more and more time. Um, mainly because it, it wasn't here, you know, it wasn't Europe and it wasn't, you know, it, it, uh, it, it made no um, claims to being a European city and, and uh, inculcating good behaviour and all the rest of it. Uh, the other city that I spent a lot of time in over the years was, uh, was Sao Paulo in Brazil, the, the largest um, city in Brazil. And I, I have to say, you know, at, at that particular time, both cities, I mean, I, I could see that they were in no way utopian spaces and, and were, were deeply problematical and, and awkward and by you know, comparison with this, um, very, very difficult places to live, but, but somehow 
uh, my, my psychological life in those places was actually rather better than it was here. So I think it, it's important to, uh, it was important for me to recognise that. Um, anyway, uh, so I, I did uh, other things that I've done. Um, I mean, one, one of the uh, uh, projects, I suppose, or you know, on, ongoing projects in, in teaching, really, and, and uh, writing, has been to, to uh, explore where um, psychoanalysis has historically made connections with, with the city and city life and architecture. Um, and uh, I did pay a lot of attention to how, how Freud represented the city. I mean, he, he doesn't talk about it that, that directly, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's there as a figure. It's very important. And uh, this, is, this is a lovely photograph. It's a collection of um, uh, travel uh, photographs. I, I, I don't have the name of the photographer, but there is a, it was a book published in... Um, I think 19, 1920 or thereabouts um, of, of European capitals and this is uh, Vienna from that time just outside the, the opera house on the, uh, the, the Ringstrasse uh, so I, I, in fact I, I went to Vienna just um, for, for I mean, various reasons not, none of them particularly well defined but, and I, I went to the Freud Museum as many of you uh, must have done but I, I got a lot out of um, looking at the, the location and thinking about what kind of buildings these were, you know, what kind of people might have lived in them, what sort of life was, was described by these streets. Um, I thought a lot about social class, I uh, thought about um, certain kinds of uh, urban ordering, and it was a you know, good, good thing to do. So, um, so I did that. There are lots more photographs that I could show. I, I went into the, the museum, and many of you have done that. There are these wonderful photographs by uh, Edmund Engelman from uh, 1938. Uh, the, it is literally the day before Freud packs up and leaves, isn't it? And, and the extraordinary pictures, uh, which many art historians have made use of. So you know, I, I, I did that. Uh, and then I, I also <laughs> thought about this. And I, th this is, um, for, forgive me for a slight, slight digression into cake, but uh, mm. uh, this. Um, I, I, I haven't really written about this, but, but I, I, I did you know, spend a lot of time trying to imaginatively reconstruct this, this life of, of early 20th century bourgeois Vienna, and that the cake did seem to be pretty symbolic. I mean, this is the, the Sasha Torta from the, the Hotel Sasha in, in Vienna. Um, and it's, um, it's a very rich chocolate cake. It has um, one or two layers. Uh, it, it's a, a, a thick chocolate coating, uh, and the the real innovation of the cake, as you know, is is that there is apricot jam in this area, so it has a tangy quality that offsets the very dense sweetness of, of the cake. I mean, it's it's an extraordinarily rich confection. I mean, you know, many of you will have had a cake like this. You know. We just served them. Could you? Do you, I mean, do you, how, how many of you have eaten Sasha Sasha Torta? Okay, yeah. So you you know what I'm talking about, and it's served with um, whipped cream, which very importantly is not sweet. It's just plain whipped cream, and that offsets the cloying sweetness of the of the cake. Um, it's a. a uh, a cake. Um, I've often shown this this picture to students because it, you know, to me, it, it actually represents a whole, you know, a whole lot of things about Vienna. That it's uh, it's very rich and cloying and sweet, and and uh, you know, involves a lot of labour to, to produce it. And it's a very respectable cake in lots of ways. And the hotel is very respectable. Um, but it, it is a cake. I mean, it seemed to me that there was very little pleasure involved in the cake, you know, and the, the rituals involved in eating the cake. This is not one that you, you know, you wouldn't go and sort of wolf it down uh, uh, and just, you know, without thinking about it. And the, the, to, to eat this cake, you need to go to the hotel and you need to sit down and, and, and sit up straight and, and uh, behave and eat the cake slowly and re reverently. You know, it's, you, you, can, you can see all that just by looking at the cake. No. And uh, on top of that, uh, it is a, a cake around which there, there was, in fact, a, a huge battle. So it was invented in 1832. Uh, then there was, uh, in the post-war period, for about 20 years, there was a legal battle between the Hotel um, uh, Sasha, which had gone bankrupt at the time, but then was, was re came back into business. 
uh, and a bakery called uh, Demel, I think. I think this is right, Demel. Uh, and they, they had a, a legal battle over the, uh, the rights to the cake. Um, and there, there, was a, there, was, there was a subtle difference between the two variants of the cake that they produced. This one uh, has uh, a single layer of apricot jam uh, between the chocolate and, the, and the, the sponge. And it's also cut into two. The demo cake has a double layer of apricot jam and is not cut into two. Uh, the, the battle took 20 years and it eventually both organisations got the right to use the name Sasha Torta, but in, in subtly different ways in a different context. But anyway, I, I, I digress. But it is, uh, it seemed to me quite, quite important in that this thing, which ostensibly was about pleasure, was actually not. It was much more complicated. That it wasn't necessarily pleasurable to, to eat. There was nothing straightforward about it at all. And there's a huge amount of anxiety and conflict and you know, all sorts of very um, negative uh, emotions attached to it as a, as a, a symbolic object in, in uh, Vienna. So anyway, that, that, that's, uh, you, you can take that or leave it, but the you know, cake was important for me. So, uh, right, uh, just a couple of other things. This um, was, I suppose, another uh, example of the way that uh, psychoanalysis or you know, some things in the orbit of psychoanalysis uh, I, I've, I've explored in a historical sense. And this is, um, well, actually, does anybody know what it is? Some, one, of, one or two of you might recognize it. Yeah, it's, it's, this is the, this is the, the Reich Museum uh, in um, Maine. Rural Maine. Uh, this is uh, Wilhelm Reich, uh, the maverick, dissident psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst uh, pupil of Freud, but then a collaborator with Freud, and then they, they, they split. Very um, strange, cu curious um, character, but uh, lo lots of very compelling writing on, on the, the place of, of sex in civilization. Uh, and uh, he, he, I think he's one of the first people to use the term the sexual revolution as a collection of, of essays from the, the 30s called The Sexual Revolution. Very sort of compelling, um, you know, ranting, really, but interesting ranting. Uh, and, uh, well, all sorts of ways that he's, in, he's interesting. But there's um, a, a theory of, of um, fascism that involves <coughs> sexual repression, he says you know, fascism comes from sexual repression. But what you're looking at here is, is a, a late phase in, in Reich where um, he, he um, start, came to believe that uh, the universe was suffused by a cosmic energy called orgone, which could be concentrated for therapeutic purposes on the body. And in particular, it would be good for, um, uh, I mean, it could cure any disease as far as he was concerned, but it was also very good for, for uh, increasing sexual potency. And, and uh, it, it, by potency, he didn't mean just you know, the ability to have an orgasm, but the, the ability to have a very complete discharge of sexual energy. And you need to read right to really understand what that means, but it, was a, uh, it, it's, um, it became a very important theory for him. What you're looking at are, are, are a series of uh, boxes called orgone energy accumulators, uh, in which you sit and uh, you, you, uh, you, you sit for a, a, an unspecified period, but normally 20 minutes to half an hour. And during that period, uh, the, uh, this cosmic radiation is supposed to be concentrated on your body and, uh, and is supposed to be therapeutically beneficial. I, I have no idea whether it, <laughs> it works at all, except, I mean, I did go and, in fact, spent <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, we're actually, I'm actually in the orgone room. In, in a, I'm in an orgone accumulator in the orgone room in the Reich Museum in, in Maine, and the orgone room is itself a giant orgone accumulator. Uh, I mean, I can do it. Well... <laughs> Did, it, Did you feel it? It's, it's, a, it, it's a very interesting question. Um, <laughs> I, do you, I, shall I tell you the story? I mean, it, it, right, okay. So, I mean, I, this is, <clears throat> this is r rural Maine. I mean, it's in the middle of nowhere. It is, it is um, very, very remote indeed. Um, and it's where Reich ended up, basically sort of hounded out of, you know, New York City and, and well, all of Europe by that stage. Um, and... The, 
Uh, I, so I said I wanted to try out the accumulators, and in fact I spent two days in the museum. You can stay in, in a cottage built by Reich on, on, on the museum's grounds, uh, which was good, a lot of fun. Um, but I was the only person in this huge complex for days. Uh, they, so I, I went to the museum staff and I said, you know, I want to try out the accumulators, you know, well, what should I do? And they said, first of all, well, you know, just give it 15 minutes or so. You don't want to sit in there too long <laughs> because it's very dangerous. And, uh, you know, the too much orgone, you'll get too charged up and, uh, you, you know, it, it, you, you, will, you, you won't feel well. So I said, OK, I'll, fine. So I, so I went into the room. The room itself is very odd. I mean, you can sort of see how odd it is. Mm. It's like a lumber room. And in fact, it was being used as a lumber room. It just happened to have half a dozen orgone accumulators in there. But uh, so, I, so I sat in this one, shut the door, and um, sort of waited. And I, I can't say I really you know, felt anything uh, at all, apart from I felt a bit silly. Um, <laughs> uh, and then so after 15 minutes, I, I decided to stop on their advice, I mean, in case you know, who knows, something bad might happen. So uh, I, I went, I went, I went out and went, went, went back up to the, the reception and said, uh, you know, nothing is really happening. Uh, what do you recommend? I said, well, that's that's okay. You, know, you probably just have to get used to it. Um, but uh, don't go in again. But go and go and have a go and have a lie down. Come back in the afternoon and give it give us another try. So I went and had some lunch and then went back. And they suggested, well, you know, maybe if you switch the lights off, that this might help. Uh, so. Uh, they said, in, in particular, you might see uh, orgone radiation, which is blue. See, so it's, it, it's, it's blue radiation flashes in the darkness, that sort of thing. So uh, I thought, well, I'll give, I'll give that a try. So I, I, I went in there, same, same accumulator, um, uh, shut the door, switched the lights off. And I, I must say, I lasted about... Not, not very long, I mean, five minutes, because suddenly what I did experience was an enormous amount of fear. That suddenly I thought, I'm in the middle of nowhere, I'm in this strange box, I've been told that I might sort of see, you know, sort of hallucinate, and, and um, I, 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 just, I just couldn't stand it anymore, so I, I just ran out, and, and, and sort of running across the room in the darkness, and you know, groping for the light switch, I mean, it felt like it, felt like it was about a mile you know, across the room. <laughs> Oh dear. Anyway, so I never went to the accumulator again after that. That was uh, that was it. Um, but it was, it, it, you know, it's it, it was a very very interesting experience because it's you know it's sort of on, on the border of, of madness really. I mean, you know, it, it, um, nobody's very sure whether whether Reich was exactly sane at this point. I mean, probably wasn't. Uh, but still, I mean, this this whole place has a has a very compelling um, effect on on uh, all sorts of people. Anyway. <coughs> Much digression. This is just to show that uh, you know I'm not, I'm not making this up, and, it, and you know it does exist in in a wider culture. And my friend uh, Igor will, will recognise this as the uh, uh, Dusan uh, Makovev um, film, uh, the uh, Mysteries of the Organism, which you may you may know, 1973 film, about the strangest film ever made. I think. Uh, anyway, but the the organ accumulator does uh, feature very heavily in this, and it's a. Uh, the, the, um, the, this character, uh, it's Milena, she's called, isn't she? That, that uh, every so often um, that she, she pops into the accumulator, and then this is usually followed by a fairly explicit sex scene. Um, so, so you know, great stuff. Uh, so, anyway, which, which brings us on to uh, sex. And uh, this, this is, there's no particular reason for putting this image up other than I, I, it makes me laugh. And I, it, it's by, um, uh, who is it by? It's by Madeleine uh, Friesendorp. Do you know her? She used to teach here, actually. But uh, Rem, Rem uh, Kohlhaas is a uh, partner, or an ex-partner. And uh, very, you know, so it's a, a sort of drawing rather in the style of uh, Tom of Finland, of these, these beefy fellows uh, eating uh, oysters uh, in a locker room um, with boxing gloves. And I don't know why. But uh, anyway, <laughs> but uh, I suppose what, what I wanted to say, uh, just a couple of things quite briefly, that, f I mean, for me, um, the language of psychoanalysis has, has been very useful in, in providing a vocabulary to talk about sex and building. So the, uh, you know, the a language of, about you know, desire, you know, you can think of all sorts of ways that, that, that it's important. So it, uh, it, it's a thread all the way through um, the book, um, Sex and Building, so it, it um, draws on a lot of um, um, basically psychoanalytical ideas and it helped me describe certain spaces and 
uh, there's one image I, I could have brought up where the, there's a lot of um, you know, very evident sexual tension between two, two characters who are photographed in, in a modernist house, and that, that it's very helpful to, to have access to a language to talk about that. So uh, sex is important, uh, also fear. <laughs> um, and you know, that's been you know, a really major theme all the way through you know, bits of teaching I've done and, and bits of research. And uh, so, so in this case, it's a photograph from, from Los Angeles, one of my trips there. I, I'm in Bel Air, um, thinking about security. And, <laughs> uh, and you know, it's, uh, th this is something, it's an idea that, that usually gets talked about in, in fairly straight social science terms. You know, it, it, it's private security firms, it's about you know, the privatization of, of, um, of, of the public realm, it's about uh, you know, rich versus poor, it's about all, all things like that. Um, I, 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 I've you know, spoken about those things, but I'm also interested in the, in the way that this seems to me to be representative of uh, a powerful neurotic anxiety about, well, all sorts of things. That it's, it's uh, a fear that, that has really almost become dislocated from it, its original object. So you, you, know, you never really see any crime or you know, anything bad going on in these, the, these areas. But you do see a lot of signs of, of people who are evidently fearful. And it's, um, you know, it's a very neurotic situation. And I think there are, you know, usefully we can deploy um, uh, you know, psychoanalytical concepts of, of um, you know, around anxiety uh, uh, in, in situations like this. We very rarely do. Okay, last, last point, I, I suppose, is to say um, that uh, this is from today's Scotsman. Uh, Scotsman, if you don't know the Scotsman, those were, those, this is the world's... English-speaking world, world's uh, worst newspaper, now down to 20,000 circulation, and if, if it lasts another two weeks, I'll be very surprised. It is, it is absolutely on its last legs. So, anyway, the, uh, right, the, the, the reason for showing this is that uh, I, I'm, I'm very interested in, in the way uh, that, that we as academics can, can engage with things in, in the world. I mean, I'm not, I'm not interested in being an academic just for the sake of being an academic, and I do want to have so-called impact. <laughs> but, you know, I do want to be able to say things about the world and, you know, to have some influence, even if in a small way. Uh, one of the ways that I, I think what we might do in this context, uh, what, what, how that might be useful, is, is informing the quality of some quite major contemporary public debates. And I think that is actually possible to do. We had you know, perhaps some allusions to that around the discussion around warfare earlier on, where sometimes the, 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 the quality of the public debate is very unsophisticated. Now, here's, here's another example where the quality of public debate is very unsophisticated and you know, it could really benefit from some of the, the ideas that are in this room at the moment, if we can articulate them in the right way. There is a happiness business or industry that's developing quite fast at the moment. And this is a very crude example of it. So you know, somebody's gone out and taken, made a survey, uh, and you know, Edinburgh comes out top, and no idea why. You know, it's absolutely no idea. Uh, anyway, it, it is. But there, there are a lot of people have a lot at stake in, in happiness. And uh, there have been many stories this year about how you might design happiness. So uh, typically, people will say if you have more cycle lanes, it makes people happy. I mean, they really do say that, and the Scottish government says that all the time. Uh, it doesn't actually act on it, but I mean, it does. It, it <laughs> says that. Uh, if you read, uh, I mean, I'm not, not going to get you know into the indie ref debate now but if you read scotland's future all 670 pages of it which i have done twice that, that it says quite a lot about happiness and well-being and but in a very very crude way I and mean, his understanding of that is is hopeless uh, this this is you know this industry mostly it's if there's any research involved in it it's advocacy research people have already decided what what position they, they're, they're going to um they're going to uh, uh support uh, and it, you know, it desperately needs to be more sophisticated. If you know, the, no question, we, you know, all, all of us in this room, we, we want people to be happy, and you know, we, we want to look after their welfare and, 
and whatever. But it, we're not going to do it by saying very crudely, uh, you know, if you do this over here, th this is the direct corollary of it. And, and actually, I said I wasn't going to talk about IndyRef, but in fact, I, I am, because I, I seem to I keep getting dragged into this. I, mean, there's a, I have a piece in the Time to Hire next week about it. But it's, um, it does seem to me that the, the, the quality of the, the debate, which has, has many people have been alienated by it, the quality of the debate, uh, is, it really is psychologically impoverished. And uh, there's an inability to recognize, the, for example, the very deep-seated and certainly irrational fears and anxieties and things like that on, on both sides, uh, until those things are, are, are given a, a proper expression, as they would do in a therapeutic context, there, there is no possibility of a real debate. There, there's a pretense of rationality which is a complete garbage, I, I, from my perspective. There's a, there's a hopeless. And, unless people can somehow get the, the very powerful, often very negative, emotions and feelings, deep-seated beliefs that, you know, it could be extremely nasty, extremely ugly, but they, they, they have to have some sort of expression, otherwise they will then have a very powerful and very negative expression afterwards, whatever the result is. And if you might, might well, I can say more about that, but I, I, I mean, no doubt that that is the case. So we, we, we need a more psychologically and emotionally sophisticated debate. So, end of story. Thank you very much. Um, I, don't, I don't know how long that was. I had no idea yeah, how long I'm sure that, that people do have questions, mm. comments, and deep-seated anxieties to express. Yeah. Um, we have about a maximum of five minutes oh, sure, to yeah, do yeah. that realistic thing. So just fine. Just one about, I found it really fascinating to talk yeah. to a bit quick. One of the things that fascinates me is there seem to be two very different strands. Yeah. Specifically, we're talking about psychoanalysis in the city. Yeah. But there's a subplot that became, became more and more compelling, which was they talk about things that are meant to be pleasurable, but yeah. are in fact unpleasurable. So mm. it began with the public square, mm. but then there's the saboteur and the, the organ community. Mm. And um, I was wondering if you had more to say about the connection between these two strands. Like, yeah. Is there something that psychoanalysis, do you think psychoanalysis can say about things that are meant to be pleasurable, but are in fact unpleasurable, mm. that you didn't explicitly say. Yeah, no, that's, that's beautifully put. I mean, to, to be honest, you know, I, I, um, it's not, uh, I didn't give this a great deal of consideration other, other than, you know, I thought I would just n narrate what, I, what I've been doing. But I think that, that is, uh, and has always been, in fact, a very important idea. There is, um, now, in uh, Frederick Jameson's work, there is, is it Jameson? Cognitive dissonance. Is that, is that Jameson, the idea of cognitive? It's not Jameson. Maybe I made it up. No, it's definitely a thing. It's a thing, isn't it? So the, so, so the idea that you, you, know, you might experience so, something that is um, superficially you know, difficult or unpleasant, you might experience as pleasure. Uh, and you know, I, I, would, I, 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 mean, I can you know, certainly relate to that, that, that concept, although I've not really, <laughs> not really um, explored it in a great way deal of detail, but you know, I'm thinking about uh, say, you know, let's say popular music, you know, lots of that is really hard and noisy and difficult and, and, and yet people consume it with enormous enthusiasm and they're put up with you know, I was at a gig, gig last week that involves standing up for four hours in a crowd of 2,000 sweaty people and you know mm -hmm. by, by any standards, deeply unpleasant Edmund Burke writes very well about this Right, there we are um, that was some of my <laughs> oh, fantastic. Know, but you know, he, he writes very mm -hmm. well in the sense that about the, the very Somatic, yeah. uh, and certainly somatic, psychosocial, psychobiological, if you like, yeah. uh, aspects of right. pleasure pain dynamics in such a situation. Great. Well, that's 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 fantastic. I mean, so I mean, it, it would it would relate to that, I think. That, um, and I, I certainly feel, uh, you know, if we to go back to these um, say architectural situations, like 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 that, or you know, well, let's let's have the contemporary version. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I feel that, you know, I, my, my difficulty in, in, in experiencing this straightforwardly as pleasurable <laughs> is uh, perfectly reasonable, I suspect, you know, widely shared and very common. It's just I, I'd like some, some expression of that. And it's not to say by any means that these things shouldn't exist, 
not, not at all. And I mean, perhaps they, 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 they need to exist, but the, the, the sophistication in the language that we have to talk about them, I mean, it seems desperately unsophisticated. So, uh, absolutely, yeah. Mm. Uh, just picking up on that, I was just thinking of um, <coughs> Whitney Davis has written, um, I think, persuasively on the uncanny, and it's mm. um, uh, very accurately and very incisively. And uh, at one point, you s- I th- it, it was very interesting what you were saying about arbitrariness. Yeah. This is a scary word for an art historian because, yeah. uh, you know, we often show images and then tell people what we think yeah. they can see. I wonder if it's not less arbitrariness and more something more precise. It's that moment when it can go either way, yeah. but it's got a tip. Mm. It can't hover, mm. and so it's either going to be deeply unpleasurable or it's yep. going to be ecstatic. You know, and it's, yeah. it's that moment that maybe you can orchestrate to some yeah. extent, mm. and, and maybe your wife was orchestrating with this organ. You know, it's, you can't sort of. I noticed that you you started off when you were in the machine feeling um, not feeling anything. Yeah. You admitted fairly rapidly that you were feeling something, and then suddenly you were running out of room. Yeah. So th- that wasn't a. a Unfeeling experience. Not, not at all, no. I mean, it, it was definitely an experience. Yeah. It wasn't the, the, the experience that was supposed to happen, in a way. Yeah. But I, I, th- I think you've got something there, because in, you know, that, I mean, of course that comes back to both uh, you know, classic theories of anxiety, but also the way that, that uh, people in practice try to manage anxiety, or try to ameliorate it. And so they're often you know, thinking about thinking of, say, CBT, which you may know about, I mean, cognitive behavioural therapy, you know, the, the successive governments have been extremely keen on, on, on that. And that, that, that does uh, try to, uh, I suppose, get sufferers to, to, to backtrack to the point where they don't reach that tipping point, where they, they, they're aware of, of uh, internal narratives to the point where experiences are... are Actually, neither one thing or the other. In a way, they they become, uh, you know, they uh, the experience of, of a place or a situation, um, the, the whole thing becomes less self-conscious or, or problematical. You know, no, I, 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 I like that. I think there's, there's something in, in that. Mm. I think that uh, I was going to say that uh, I think ambivalence is a very good psychoanalytic word that I right. often think it gives to our history and our story and sort of that. Mm. His ability to be able to acknowledge that things can be two things at the same time, yeah. psychically, emotionally, and there's no reason why they shouldn't be. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's also very good. I, mean, I think, um, you know, one thing we, we you know, we, in, in contexts like this, we often hear a lot about theory and, you know, th- things that are in books. <laughs> but the, the, the practice of psychoanalysis or practice of, of psychotherapy involves um, living with a huge amount of ambivalence and, you know, maybe thinking two things at the same time. And allowing that to, to happen, maybe uh, you know, and it, it, you'd, I suppose, you know, from from either side of the the chair, you know, you develop a, a huge amount of, of um, patience and you know, abilities to, to live with things, not to expect them to be resolved. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm that that you know, I, that you know, my, my experience of that, and you know, reading about it, and also you know, experiencing it, has had a big impact on the way that I would teach and do research, actually. There's another thing that struck me, which is about the dimension that, you know, looking at the public square and mm. thinking about your account of Edinburgh and Edinburgh, the, 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 the relief you experience in going to LA, mm. the Whit City. Mm. Um, it, it, it's this kind of, uh, there's that French book that was published, or, or set of books, published in 1989, the 200th anniversary of um, you know, the storm of the Tweed or whatever. Mm. Um, and, and um, called sites of memory. Mm. And one of the things about these public spaces in in uh, cities that have this uh, long bourgeois history um, is that they are themselves vehicles for historical memory. Yeah. And it be sites to focus, you know, certain political consciousnesses and so on. Um, <coughs> I mean, they're also often sites of conflict, social struggle, aren't they? That, that, that's part of their historical marker. Um, and, uh, you know, I wondered how that relates, you know, so that sense of those public spaces and the escape to the grid city, yeah. how that relates then to the, um, 
I wonder what metaphors you you wanted to use or what mm. structures you saw in place with the tenements, you know, the run of tenements. Because mm. um, in a way we're moving then from this idea of the, the historically inscribed city mm. and self-consciously uh, the city as a kind of historical text, mm. right? To um, this, this sort of, um, um, what's the word? Monadism yeah. of, of of everybody's individual lives, yeah. kind of line up, mm. to, you know, the the, the 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 sort of machine for living of the nineteenth yeah. century or whatever it is. I mean, what's what's the yeah. how does that how does that dimension to you relate to these rather bigger, mm. if you like, visions of the. Yeah. Well, it's a very good question. I mean, if you, you know, if you, if we were to refine it and think about, well, what what metaphors would you use in relation to that? Well, I mean, I I um, started to. I suppose I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd often use words like network or you know well grid sometimes, but you know net I, 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 words that that seem to imply some some horizontality and you know flatness and lack of hierarchy and. Uh, uh, well, you know, it's interesting to hear about Ehrenberg earlier on because it's you know the the that uh, the term he he uses a lot, de-differentiation, this sort of conscious you know willed uh, uh, not seeing things in terms of of points or centres or, or things like that. Uh, yeah, that 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 was very influential actually. So you know this this um, it's almost like this represents a mode of vision that that escapes from from. Uh, you know, either you know consciously looking for foci of attention, or or being told that something is important. You know, it seemed like you know, I could escape into this uh, as a, and I, I didn't find that troubling. The way you know clearly you know many many, you know, many people here might find that that notion very troubling. I found it an absolutely you know, blessed relief from from this. I mean honestly, and I, that that has been one of the most powerful experiences of the last ten years for me. Has been has been this you know sort of struggling with different. Sort of ways of being in cities. I mean, that may, it's no, no exaggeration at all. Um, but you know, I'm I'm still here. That's the odd thing is that I, I'm actually here, <laughs> and I'm not there. And, you know, there, I, I mean, I have no plans to be there, <laughs> other than here. You know, that's that's. You know, but I can't explain that either. But you know, there we are. But it's it is uh, it's a it, it was a, it's a very very powerful experience for me that. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we need to move on. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so our uh, final session of the day uh, is being convened by Dr. David Holt. Thanks for that. The final. <laughs> <laughs> uh, David Holt is uh, is based at the University of East Anglia and also at the Minories in Colchester. And uh, he's worked for, for some time on the relationship between psychoanalysis and art uh, in various different research projects. Um, he's done quite a lot of work on the British art historian Adrian Stokes, um, who is very influenced by psychoanalysis, uh, especially by the client study that we heard about earlier. Um, what, what we're going to be hearing about today is um, neuroethics, so uh, neuroscience and potential contribution to our history and aesthetics and the relationship that may or may not have with psychoanalytic theory and art history. That was my attempt to turn the lights up a bit. Up? Why? They seem to have gone down. Was, we were worrying that it was getting too gloomy for people. Do people feel it's too gloomy, or is it appropriately gloomy? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's appropriate. Uh, okay, people are happy with that. <laughs> At the end, we can, there, there's a sparkly ceiling. We'll try and turn that on the corner again. Yeah. It's lovely here, because you've got this thing from ceiling. Yeah. But anyway, appropriately gloomy, okay. Um, so, I'm standing up just to keep you awake, basically. Uh, but um, I sort of I say that to, to, to gain your sympathy, I suppose. But um, I think I deserve your sympathy actually for two reasons. Uh, one is give, being given the, the, the final slot, which I think was my fault actually, so I should admit to that. Um, but the other is that I'm going to talk about uh, uh, art and neuroscience. Um, and, and well, let me do it, and then you'll see what I mean. So, what I, what I, the reason I'm doing this is to open up a, a conversation 
that, uh, that I think desperately needs to take place between those in art studies who are attracted to psychoanalytic theories and a rather different group who gravitate more towards neuroesthetics. And uh, what I'm chiefly interested in is a possible convergence now uh, between uh, this small group of uh, neuroenthusiasts, as we might call them, and the more populist group who are psychoanalytically trained. I want to say right from the start that I would come into the latter category. In other words, I'm very much in the psychoanalytic camp. But for some years now, I've been very interested in this convergence. Uh, uh, my interest in psychoanalysis will become clear later on um, as I focus on the psychoanalytic art theory developed by, by uh, Adrian Stokes and others in the 1940s. But let's begin uh, with a brief, because this is what we wanted to do, um, a brief survey of neuroesthetics, um, which will be very brief will be extremely sketchy and will be very much from my point of view. Uh, it will be a perspective. It's certainly not an overview. Um, how do I change the slide? Just, uh, you have to use this... Um, the use the keyboard. Find it close to the you. OK. So, yeah, so sketchy, but there we go. So the history of so-called neuroart history um, can be traced to the 1970s and the influential Reith lectures uh, delivered in 1976 by the neurobiologist Colin Blakemore. And this image of the brain here as um, wiring and circuitry, I think, is sort of emblematic of, of the period. It's from a book called uh, Mechanics of the Mind, the sort of book of the lectures. It was Blakemore, largely, who inspired young scholars like John O'Nions and Martin Kemp, uh, supported by Ernst Gombrich and others, who went on to forge links between art, history, and uh, brain science. Ultimately, the origins of this movement could be linked to the art and science atmosphere of the late 1960s, which is why I show you this slide, and the activities of a new breed of curators and uh, systems theory or cybernetics informed um, artists and theorists interested in pattern, vision, and information science. But the point I want to stress about the the science at this time, uh, particularly in the 1970s, is that it was largely uninterested in emotions, or so-called affective brain states. And this was uh, partly because at that time it had a very simplistic model of the emotions, the so-called limbic system theory, which subsequently was, has been shown to be uh, insufficient. But it was also uh, due to you know, simple prejudice uh, in the area popular at that time, cognitive science, uh, which simply didn't view emotions as a, a credible topic to research, a fundable uh, research area. Now, as we know, at the same time as this rather skewed, um, overly cerebral, perhaps, optical aesthetics, neuroesthetics, started gaining a foothold, there was an explosion of interest in psychoanalysis, uh, in the arts and humanities, which culminated, I think, in Sophie say, in the 1990s. And for me, the 1990s really was the heyday. This is when um, art historians, myself included, became immersed in Lacanian, Foucauldian, Christadian perspectives and so on, uh, using psychoanalysis as a way to develop sophisticated micro-histories, really, uh, which were generally revisionist. Uh, Marxism was essential to this revisionist art history, and of course feminist psychoanalytic aesthetics were particularly popular, uh, producing the well-known uh, so-called new art history uh, that Griselda Pollock and others uh, specialised in. Um, so, that's well known, but meanwhile, I think at the same time, the, uh, the science was getting more sophisticated, uh, and some art historians who didn't plunge into continental post-structuralism and so forth, instead became excited by the new neuroanatomical discoveries. It was in the 1990s that brain scanning, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, CT scanning, so on, suddenly became viable, and largely as a result of these new technologies coming on stream, uh, new scientific theories were developed, which had implications for the history of art. Um, in the 1990s, mirror neurons were discovered in monkeys, um, an area of research 
perhaps less essential now than it was once thought to be, that, but, for, but, but that for a while uh, genuinely seemed to um, have enormous interest and chimed with the literature on mimesis, um, imitation in art. Um, but most importantly and lasting is the principle of neuroplasticity, uh, which was again firmly established in the 1990s and is still the fundamental, although it can be traced back to William James, who really uh, proposed it uh, you know, a century earlier. Um, but it's still the fundamental concept upon which uh, neuroaesthetics are built. Um, in terms of a convergence between psychoanalytic ideas and new post-cognitive ideas about the emotional brain, um, there was first the basic emotions theory, replacing the limbic system theory. Um, the basic emotions theory now largely, I think, discredited, and then the more sophisticated affective neuroscience that scientists have more recently been working on and that I've become very interested in. Now, some of this work... Um, Let's just change the slide. Um, some of this work... <laughs> it's sort of very young there, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, which incorporated theories of how the brain uh, has evolved over millions of years. Um, it's interesting, Kate came up in the previous talk. Jo I, I noted down here while I was on the train, Joseph Ledoux um, uh, talk, talks in a lecture he gives that's you know, popular on YouTube about the brain being an unmade cake, which is still, as it were, being baked, he says. There you go. This is your brain. Um, this idea, though, of the evolving brain um, encouraged the further thought that Gombrich and others had initiated in the 1960s of pushing back art history so as to explore art's possible origins, about which is now very, very large uh, literature from the uh, sort of um, Desmond Morris and so on to the much more sophisticated hypotheses of various university-based uh, anthropologists producing um, new theories of art, uh, such as David Lewis Williams' uh, Mind in the Cave, which has kind of become one of the better-known classics. Um, the general idea that, again, can be traced back to Gombrich, I think, is that there are core things that can be said about the human brain and how it has evolved that help explain art not just in, in Paleolithic and Neolithic periods, but also more recently in human history and even today. Uh, the classicist uh, Nigel Spivey um, helped popularise this approach in the series he made for the BBC that many of you would have seen, How Art Made the World, um, building this time on Vilyana um, Ramachandran's 2003 Reef Lectures and featuring interesting new, although controversial, theories such as the importance of so-called peak shift effect and the principle of exaggeration. Um, but there was always, a, I think, uh, a big problem, certainly I had a big problem, with thinking along these lines, not least that it's extreme positivism and oversimplifications uh, alienated, I think, uh, many in the humanities. One of the difficulties for conventionally trained art theorists was the level of commitment they felt to psychoanalytic theories which undeniably have hugely helped art historians and cultural theorists uh, for some time now to insist on the importance of affect, whereas old-school neuroscientists appeared unable or unwilling to account for non-cognate processes. Um, most art, art theorists have continued to adhere to core Freudian and post-Freudian, especially Lacanian theories, largely because of this, whereas scientists including the majority of psychologists, as was pointed out earlier, seem to believe more and more in, uh, you know, went against Freud and believed in the, what you might call the computational brain, uh, whereby the arts were largely superfluous. Stephen Pinker, for example, um, has argued that art, music in particular, is rather like cheesecake, nice to eat but hardly essential. Um, this has been refuted in the last decade, however, um, I think both sides have begun to break down these barriers. Um, partly because of the far more sophisticated picture that's now emerging. Uh, this has been helped, I think, by some in the humanities who've bothered to look at the science and engage with it, even if their findings have been largely sceptical. Alva Noe and uh, Ruth Lees are important sceptical voices in the United States, for example. 
While here, figures like Hilary Rose uh, and Raymond Tallis um, have warned about the dangers of uh, a naive neuromania. Nevertheless, despite these very useful critiques, and I genuinely mean that, I do think they're useful, and often very accurate, there are probably more now who accept that neuroscience is, is making a huge contribution, with an increasing number of conferences and well-funded product projects that deliberately seek to connect art theorists and the scientists who have now begun to take more of an interest in creativity and the history of the arts and, uh, you know, take it more seriously. Music is probably the biggest area now studied if you want to pursue this uh, and some of the, you know, the best science is being done on the, uh, the nature of music, music and how it works. But visual art is also increasingly popular. So, what has all this got to do with the history of art as uh, a humanities discipline, which is what I'm supposed to be interested in? Um, and what's it got to do with art theories of the 1940s that I want to come on to in just a moment? Um, well, for historical materialists, affective neuroscience is arguably a gift because it allows, uh, finally, some very concrete things to be said about uh, psychological uh, factors such as changes of style. Uh, it also, obviously, um, helps in assessing emotional response and um, begins to suggest how we might penetrate this so-called private world of feeling. There's a much greater clarity now about what is actually going on biologically when we think or feel or emote, and this is helpful. It includes the realisation that, in fact, thoughtful art making isn't all in the mind, certainly not all in the brain. The uh, study of affective responses in rats and other mammals has shown the extent to which Merleau-Ponty and others were right about body and brain being one and the same system and, you know, impossible to separate. Uh, there's a lot of literature on this. Um, the, the rat literature is particularly strong on fear, which so you, uh, you might want to follow that one up. The study of affective responses... Uh, sorry, so it's, it's a mistake um, only to study the biology from the neck up, in other words. It's been a, you know, a key finding. Ethological studies are also showing how important it is to appreciate group psychology and social interaction. The science is showing, in fact, how the extraordinary abilities that humans have, including their capacity to make art, is due to the fact that we're a social species, uh, that we collaborate and are able to put ourselves in each other's shoes. It's because we have these um, aesthetic, uh, em empathetic uh, abilities that we also have the capacity to think, plan, worry, fear, uh, feel fearful emotions, feel envious, feel ambitious, and so on and so forth. Uh, suspicious, maybe, and so on. Art, moreover, isn't only, it seems, a representational vehicle for consciously constructed human communication, which is the semiotic view, I guess. Neuroscience is beginning to reveal that just as important is the ability of art to represent non-conscious emotional states, which have little to do with cognitive processing. They might, in fact, be totally unavailable to uh, consciousness. Um, so they're more to do with uh, something intuitively felt. What some scientists are also beginning to realise is that the philosophers and psychoanalysts to whom their colleagues in the humanities are so strongly attached may in fact have not been so far off the mark. Much of the science of affective states isn't contradicting speculative ideas about the human condition, it seems. Rather, it's finding how accurate many of these early uh, psychophilosophical theories were. And so that gives me my excuse to do what I really want to do, which is look at Adrian Stokes. So, I want, so okay, so let's shift gear now um, and treat this as an interesting forerunner of these new ideas in the life, well, in the, in the, yes, the life and work of Adrian Stokes, whose major body of psychoanalytic thinking was developed. Uh, during and immediately after the Second World War, even though he's more famous for his writings from the 1930s. Uh, now, we're only beginning to appreciate, I think, quite how clever Stokes's art theory was. 
And uh, just at the start of understanding, in fact, what he was trying to get across, is partly because of the elaborate way in which he writes. But the first thing to say about this is that Stokes's art theory and the art theory of Kleinian psychoanalysis aren't one and the same thing. Um, recent research in Stokes studies has shown how at odds Stokes's art theory was with the principal literature from which he was drawing inspiration. So I want to look first at Klein's ideas before mo moving on to Stokes's. Um, a good way of approaching Klein's ideas about art is to discuss her long dialogue with Stokes, in fact, in both a therapeutic and a post-therapeutic context. Stokes, it turns out, is one of the adult patients whose treatment is outlined as a detailed case history in Klein's classic 1932 book, The Psychoanalysis of Children. Here he, appear, he appears as a patient Klein refers to as uh, Mr. B. And we know from this, if he is Mr. B, and we think he almost definitely is, that the reason Stokes went into analysis was ostensibly to correct his homosexuality after which he was able to change his bohemian inclination to have multiple partners, both male and female, eventually to marry the painter Margaret Mellis, embracing conventional family life after the move to wartime St. Ives. Um, Stokes is also patient to see in a two-part series of psychoanalytic papers Klein published towards the end of his seven-year treatment. Uh, whether Stokes actually suffered from... Uh, sorry, her papers which are focus on what she refers to as the psychogenesis of manic depressive states. These are quite famous papers, so you may know them. Um, whether Stokes actually suffered from a bipolar disorder or something similar is debatable. He certainly, however, had panic attacks and bouts of depression, and Klein clearly helped with his recovery from these episodes. Um, this, though, is where we find what Klein has to say about artists. Since her patient whom she saw on a daily basis between 1931 and 1938, was an artist in two senses. Mainly, uh, Stokes was a very talented uh, creative writer working in prose genres. Uh, and, you know, the interpretation of his work has had to really dig deep to kind of figure out what genres he, he was writing in uh, because he keeps changing and, you know, knowing that is, is something of a key to understanding you know, what he's saying. But also by 1936, he'd taken up oil painting, informing his 1937 publication, Colour and Form. Now, what Klein says about patiency, however, is that this was somewhat against her advice. So Klein's aim was to help the patient uh, resolve his adult depressive tendencies, which she reasons derive from what she famously identifies as the depressive position experienced in infancy. You all went through it. The depressive position occurs as the baby transitions from paranoid schizoid heart object perceptions of his parents to understanding them as introjected whole objects. This is a step um, towards progressing beyond infantile omnipotence so as to be able to understand uh, the inner self but also the external world um, and those two things as separate entities no longer merged. And so, uh, to be able to relate healthily to the, um, to the apartness or otherness of reality. The depressive position, though, is inevitably accompanied by huge anxieties which have to be worked through, from which the ego is constantly recoiling in what she refers to as a flight. A flight to the good internal object, or alternatively, and in Sosa's case, probably predominantly, a flight to external good objects. This is essentially what writing or make, making art entails, then. So, what we can imply from there, what we can infer from this, is, is, is uh, that much of Stokes' therapy, and the notes have come to light quite recently, they make very colourful reading, um, much of Stokes' therapy with Klein involves her implying that his artistic impulses are just immature and bound up with his illness. They're about running away from adult anxieties instead of facing them. By 1945, though, you'll be pleased to hear, um, Stokes had come to believe that although he accepted many of Klein's ideas about the primary 
sadistic fantasies that were part and parcel of normal development, often revisited in adulthood, probably because they hadn't been properly worked through in infancy. Although he went along with this and was a very loyal Kleinian, uh, art wasn't just or even principally, he thought, to be understood in terms of pathological processes and unhelpful defence mechanisms. In his largely autobiographical study, Inside Out, Stokes develops what we can call his outwardness theory, which is to do with projecting positive feelings outwards, externally, as a way not of fleeing into the arms of illusion, but instead loving the external world through making art that engages intimately with it, so strengthening the ego through processes of projection, introjection, identification, and so on. Now, the principal example of this uh, that Stokes uses um, is Cezanne's late phase when many of his paintings were views of Mont Saint Victoire. While other critics, Clement Greenberg, for example, tended to describe Cezanne's form and colour use in terms of its foreshadowing of modernist abstraction, Stokes was conscious also of the symbolism of landscapes like this, and especially the reassuring stillness and stability. I'm reminded, actually, of Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> something of that quality, doesn't it? But, um, but the mountain, um, obviously symbolising that, and, uh, and the landscape itself. So this kind of art activity, Stokes reasons, has to be about more than a flight to illusion, indicative of neurosis. More importantly, it registers what Freud called object-seeking and positively engaging with the real. The, uh, the main point for Stokes about the outside world is its inertness, which offers the opportunity uh, for achieving psychic stability and the relief of anxiety, actually. In, in his case, the relief of anxiety symptoms. Uh, external reality is dichotomously opposed to internal reality, which, because it's uh, living and always on the move, our psychic world, therefore it is, is vulnerable to schizoid disorders. But art making, consequently, when it's employed in the most felicitous way, engages us with the real world, so as temporarily to anchor the psyche. Aesthetic observation is largely about interrupting and calming the usual, you know, kind of rush, the hus hustle and bustle of uh, normal psychic life in a post-industrial urban setting. Um, and uh, calming the worrisome rumination that therapy attempts to mitigate. So pausing to make art or to appreciate art uh, far from a sign of neurosis was for Stokes, in fact, a very healthy, rewarding and natural activity. Its roots might lie in the resolution of anxiety by a flight to the good, uh, but in adulthood and probably in childhood as well, the effect of this is to provide safe harbour, as he puts it. Now, another example uh, is Alfred Wallace's painting Voyage to Labrador. Sorry, this is Margaret Menace, and that's just... These are contextual shots, but we'll look at this painting here. Um, and Stokes says this has two principal qualities. The first is its narrative and literal movement, the journey implied in the title and depicted in the, um, the way it seems to uh, move through the waves, the forward pointing of the ship's bows, um, the smoke going in an opposite direction, actually. Um, but for Stokes, the, 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 the main thing the picture does, in fact, is to fix movement. So I'm quoting now from Colour and Form. Wallace's brown boat upon the slush brown icy sea is a form of which I shall never tire because its fixture there palpitates anew and anew. Two opposite references, he says, two worlds of feeling are merged in this earth-coloured sea to which the boat is joined. So not cutting through it, but joined to it. Um, not as one form posed in relation to another, he says, but as a form with roots in another, as it were, from which it grows and whose opposite nature it displays under the dramatic guise of rooted, rooted affinity. Um, and Stokes' argument, I think, is that Wallace, a fisherman, 
intuitively understands the sea. His is not an inter... There is bottom left, um, being poked in the eye by Ben Nicholson. So, um, so um, Wallace, in other words, knows not only the upper world of wind, waves, and ice, He's unique as a painter in that he understands the, the, this unseen world of the, the world of the fish below the surface of the waves. And more importantly, conveys the extent to which these two worlds of feeling are joined. Quoting Stokes again, boat and sea are in reality bound by interaction, he insists, in what he also calls identity and difference or mutual enhancement. Now, as Alex Potts has pointed out, we get a similar sense of this uh, fixing inside-outside dichotomous interrelationship in Barbara Hepworth's sculpture uh, of this period. And I've added also Nicholson's still lives, uh, paintings that Peter Lanyon began in 1946, known as the Generation Series, which have this strong sense of the inside-outside nature of the landscape. Um, and so Stokes also in his second semi-autobiographical theoretical work, Smooth and Rough, um, underlines the importance of texture, contrasting the textural bite and whiteness of decorative, uh, decorative stone in Quattrocento architecture with um, the blackness and complete smoothness of the buildings, um, as he puts it, enticing apertures. But in all these examples, there's, there's this dichotomy or interdependence, that Stokes argues, is felt much more than it's consciously perceived. In fact, it might not be consciously perceived in that way. It undeniably derives, he says, from processes of dealing with infantile depressive anxiety, but regardless of this, works on the viewer in benign and profoundly beneficial ways. Stokes felt that psychoanalysts, by and large, didn't appreciate this. Uh, he later explained in an interview with Guy Brett, quote, I'm waging a war with the psychoanalyst's approach to art. They just don't understand it. So, what was it that the psychoanalyst didn't understand, but that Stokes thought fundamental to the nature of art, embedded as it was in what he called colourform orchestration? So here is where we need to understand Stokes' slightly earlier and more famous contrast between carving and modelling. Modelling was eclipsed in advanced sculptural practices in the 1920s and early 1930s by a new taste for direct carving, which Henry Moore and others did much to promote. Stokes elevated, however, the carving-modelling dichotomy to a fundamental principle applicable to all art forms, including painting, ballet, and even new art forms such as cinema. Art forms that are modelled are somewhat suspect in Stokes' view because they're recklessly virtuosic, as in Baroque art, which was one of his favourite examples. They tend to accelerate movement to create entertainment and excitement, but this exacerbates inner turmoil rather than quelling or calming it. Um, great arts, however, this is a, a contrast between Edinburgh and Los Angeles is coming to mind here very strongly. Um, great art, this would be in Los Angeles, stabilises the psyche by fixing and spatialising perception. It's a reprieve temporarily from the usual process of uh, mentally rushing from one thing to the next. For Stokes, this hadn't been understood, however, by, particularly by the Bloomsbury movement, certainly not by vorticist abstraction. Um, carving principle had been largely lost with the arrival of modernity. However, artists such as Nicholson and Hepworth were working, quite, uh, were working partly to restore this badly needed, yet sadly neglected, as he calls it, quattro, cento, two words, quality. Uh, bourgeois surrealism. I said I'd fit bourgeois into here. I really struggle to get it, because there's no connection. But um, he wouldn't have liked it, basically, <laughs> um, for obvious reasons. Um, the nearest we can get is um, his hatred, as far as I can tell, of Francis Bacon. Um, although he did, uh, I think you can argue, increasingly acknowledge that this kind of art was undeniably powerful, um, and he didn't, for example, try to dissuade the Tate Gallery from acquiring works like the one on the right, Cesar's, Cesar's Thumb, which he 
clearly found very impressive. Uh, Stokes' own tastes, though, are rather beside the point here. The main thing he underlines is that art, all art, whether carved or modelled, still or reckless, uh, unified or plastic, reveals the central part that feelings play, both in art making and in the contemplation of art. Here, then, I'm suggesting there is this potential convergence uh, between this kind of psychoanalytic theory and recent neuroaesthetics, or at least the branch of neuroaesthetics dealing with affective states. Bear with me. <laughs> For Stokes, a good comparison is between art and science. Um, scientists, he says, have to be dispassionate. They have to suspend their feelings in order to study nature objectively with full Aristotelian logic. In fact, at one point in his argument, he even recommends that all scientists should be in therapy, daily therapy, so that they can have uh, some sort of outlet uh, for this uh, the emotions that they have to have as human beings, um, but have to dispel in order to function well in the laboratory. Um, artists, however, and art lovers, uh, give full rein to their feelings, in Stokes' view. Art is the complement, then, to science because it does what science cannot do. It engages our feelings. This, Stokes points out, is no trivial thing. Um, that art does. Like many of his generation, he believed that art ideally consoles, uh, replacing what in earlier times had been the function of religion. It's no surprise, perhaps, that uh, having personally experienced the tragedy brought about by the First World War, he had two brothers, one who died and one who um, was shell-shocked. And then his own experience of the Second World War. It's hardly a surprise that Stokes in the post-war period felt that what was required of art was repair and healing. It was unfortunate then that instead of this, uh, many artists chose to examine and reflect upon violence and psychic disturbance. Although Stokes and his generation, principally Herbert Reed, took this as perfectly understandable and a phase from which you know, art would grow up from, um, eventually to emerge to embrace consolation and vitality once again. So art always uh, ultimately makes a positive contribution. It's always ultimately benign. Um, just to note, I mean, we, we might want to question this today. Art doesn't always console. It's been shown by anthropologists in the wake of Alfred Gell's influence, influential research, for example, uh, often to have an aggressive function. However, Stokes's core argument is that art, great art at any rate, always engages not just the intellect or even primarily the intellect, rather it engages the emotions, or more accurately, human feelings. Um, and I think this is probably a very useful insight. This brings me back to the uh, relevance of recent efforts then at understanding consciousness and the feeling brain through anatomical investigation and experiment. Um, scientists, for example, have been making progress recently on understanding exactly how the biology of feeling might operate, the so-called mechanisms of affect, or its affect's circuitry. The most important finding, perhaps, is that feelings are not best understood as an inconvenience that we'd be better off without. Rather, they are essential, fundamental, human, fundamentally human ways that we have of dealing with environmental opportunities and threats. In other words, they may even explain uh, why we've been such a su successful species. Without emotions and feelings, it's arguable that other, more conscious intellectual processes wouldn't be available. The intellect, in fact, may be merely a last step in the affective chain, useful in survival terms just as a check as to whether it's wise to take the course of action that the emotions are strongly advising. You know, run away or not. It's not always advisable to run away. Feelings in this hypothesis are the first step in perceiving the emotion and assessing its advisability then. And all of this is fundamentally connected to mental imaging. Uh, and the making of memory, because one would want to remember that and learn uh, that in that situation, uh, uh, you know, facing the threat was the better course of action. This, of course, isn't news to many in the humanities, but it is an exciting area of research in the psych scientific community. Um, this allows psychoanalytically inclined thinkers, I think, to confidently revisit some of the ideas 
uh, that it seems are now being confirmed. Stokes' psychoanalytic art, art theory, for example, does seem to have anticipated many of these findings. For Stokes, art is the epitome, as he puts it, of human feeling, which is also to clarify what science is, by the way. Stokes is very clear about this. Uh, science, he says, is no poor cousin to art. Give all over to science, he writes at the end of his book about Venice. Science is the way of truth, the only way to peace of mind. So give over everything to science, he says, without a qualm. Why? Because the new glory, as he puts it, that science can achieve, illumines the imaginative life. Okay, it doesn't threaten it, it illumines it. He, he, calls, he, he says it makes it a purer imaginative life because it's conceived and called so after the victories of science. And what he's talking about here is something he also refers to as the atomic gift, so you have to position this uh, in its time. Um, he did think that uh, you know, the discovery of atomic power was uh, going to be an immensely liberating thing. But he continues, let's not be frightened to apply that word fantasy to what we value most. Fantasy can't be undermined if utter devotion is also paid to truth. The most profound object of contemplation is the relationship of fantasy with reality between the partial and the impartial. To make the distinction absolute, he says, to value both its terms, this will be the highest achievement of man. Uh, he then goes on in his later writing uh, to explore what kinds of feeling might be epitomised in art, and I'll deal with this far too briefly. Um, whereas therapeutic psychoanalysis tended to continue in its belief that art was somehow bound up with psychopathy, uh, Hannah Siegel was mentioned, for example, um, uh, and she had theories such as her theory of art being similar to the symptom uh, of symbolic equation that she saw, saw in one or two of her patients. Um, but Stokes argued that art was more to do with general human experiences that we all feel, such as, for example, the feeling of uh, being taken out of oneself um, when one lies back, looks at the stars on a campsite or something like that. Uh, and that this was the title of one of his Imago Society papers. Now, the, um, the example of art that Stokes keeps coming back to as his pinnacle of artistic achievement is the famous Tempesta by Giorgione. And I want to just look at that very briefly um, because I think thinking about why this particular painting was like, you know, like, 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 like honey to a... A, a bear. It was it was the painting that would give you this hit that was supremely powerful, but nobody was quite sure why. So not only Stokes thought in this way. Uh, Kenneth Clark, for example, had a very similar strong appreciation for the Tempesta, uh, although the subtle differences between Stokes's take on this painting and Clark's slightly different, uh, slightly different reading of it uh, are very revealing. Uh, revealing of I guess of what Stokes' uh, absorption in psychoanalysis added to his interpretation. Um, but it's worth, it's worth reading Clark. Uh, in his 1953 account, Clark seems to use a very similar vocabulary to the one developed by Stokes, employing words such as recondite and incantatory, which are, incantatory, which are, are, are very Stokesian terms. He probably read Stokes before he wrote his own piece. The mood, anyway, that Clark feels the painting conveys is for him best explained by referring to contemporary literature, Arcadian poetry. But not only that, the mood is also to do with the fact that ultimately, he says, despite extensive uh, art historical investigation, no one knows, he says dramatically and mysteriously, no one knows what it represents. Well, for Stokes, however, the unknown or only guessed at narrative is far less important. Uh, he, he explains it quite easily. And while he doesn't in any way deny the painting's incantatory power, its ability to evoke mood and affect, nevertheless he believes this can be explained in relatively scientific terms. First of all, he says, you have to see the painting in ideal lighting conditions or a, on a you know, PowerPoint slide in Edinburgh. Uh, Stokes' first revelatory experience in front of the painting, in fact, seems to have taken place in 1926, so we can actually position him. Uh, when the painting uh, wasn't in the Academy and where it is now, it was in the 
uh, Palazzo Giovanelli, where he says uh, it had it, it, the light was felicitous. And so it, it, he's almost saying only he, of all his friends, has seen this thing uh, working effectively. So, you know, um, he can tell us about it. Um, but anyway, this just did it for Stokes. You know, it, this painting uh, was uh, just hit him emotionally, rather like a moving passage of mu music, or in, in fact, more accurately, like a moment in a piece of music, ballet or opera, or even uh, a moment in cinema when everything comes together suddenly in, in a single passage, and then it, you lose it again, and the whole thing, you know, roars ahead in, in, in Hollywood horror, but that for a moment you had this experience. Now, he, in his 1937 book, Colour and Form, he describes this as the letterbox effect. And this is the best photograph of a letter, but it really doesn't work. But um, he recounts how one dull day in May, and the dullness is important because it would have taken the redness out of the red telephone box. If it's too red, you won't get the effect. Anyway, suddenly he encounters this and I quote, small red letterbox fixed to a telegraph pole. And he says, it created a high point, an image that seems to me all embracing of chromatic identity and difference. Uh, similarly, in the Giorgione, uh, the, the, the letterbox is obviously this man's red tunic. Um, and uh, what he says is that the red tunic is painted uh, so cleverly not for cheap compositional reasons, but rather so as perfectly to set off the greens in the rest of the picture and the flesh tones and the whiteness of the architecture and so on of the next. So it's, it's like a, a, an orchestrated symphony. Um, and I put the Vanessa Bell up there just to provide contrast because this is, this is we know that Stokes hated this. Uh, so this may, be, may seem to be doing a similar kind of thing with the pinkness of the... Uh, tray here, uh, but no, it's compositional. So this is orchestrated. This is like uh, a symphony, and this, Stokes would say, is like jazz, you know, cheap pop music. Uh, so an example also would be uh, Bruegel's landscape with the fall of Icarus, where again, he feels it can be argued that the painting isn't so much composed or balanced as exquisitely arranged like a symphony. The musical comparison, um, I think, by the way, is offered so as to suggest a far greater complexity and hence this uh, deeper emotional response. There's equal insistence, he says, across this painting, but also, Stokes insists, an emotionally felt unconscious or non-conscious symbolism and spatiality which he implies can't be fully appreciated by, for example, uh, his literary friends, including W.H. Auden, who um, uh, wrote famously in his poem about the painting, how it takes place with when uh, human, it's about human suffering, basically, how it takes place while someone else is eating, cake maybe, or opening uh, a window or just walking dully along. But for Stokes, this literary interpretation, while not untrue, is merely a pretext. Icarus is down here, in case you haven't spotted it. Um, are we over time? Yeah, okay. So, okay, okay, well let's just, let's just finish then on this, this slide, um, which is one of Stokes' own paintings and uh, what I want to do with this is not talk about his painting, but give you a quote from uh, uh, a bit of neuroanatomy. This is from um, Antonio Damasio's book, Looking for Spinoza, uh, Joy, Sorrow, and the Feeling Brain. And this is uh, the time in the lecture where you can sort of breathe and relax and feel calm, because that's what he wants you to do. Okay. Think, he says, of lying down on the sand, the late day sun gently warming your skin. Doing this? The ocean lapping at your feet, a rustle of pine needles somewhere behind you, 
a light summer breeze blowing, 78, sorry, it's always so accurate, 78 degrees Fahrenheit, <laughs> not 75, <laughs> anyway, not a cloud in the sky, he says, so take your time and savour the experience. I will assume, he then says, you weren't bored to tears, because that would be a different kind of feeling, uh, but that instead you felt very well, exceedingly well. And the question is, what did that feeling well consist of, exactly? The answer he gives is that it consisted of an extremely satisfying mental perception of the emotion derived from the experience, accompanied by, or comprised of, a proliferation of images. Now, this is the bit that I find very interesting. He says, and then, when you could direct your attention... So he's trying to trace what happened in that experience. When you could, tr you could direct your attention away from the sheer <coughs> well-being of the moment, when you could enhance the mental representations that didn't pertain directly to your body, then you found that your mind was filled with thoughts whose themes created a new wave of pleasurable feeling. The picture of events you eagerly anticipated as pleasurable came to mind, as did scenes you enjoyed... Ex You've got a power cut? The lights are doing fine. Okay. I'll, I'll continue. Um, so he says, the picture of events you eagerly anticipated as pleasurable came to mind, as did scenes you enjoyed experiencing in the past. So memory. Also, you found that your cast of mind was felicitous. You adopted a mode of thinking in which images have a sharp focus and flowed abundantly and effortlessly. The appearance of thoughts with themes consonant with the emotion and a mode of thinking, a style of mental processing, uh, which increased the speed of image generation and made images more abundant. 